This is one of the greatest rags to riches stories that I have ever heard. And in this case, it is Henry C. and he is from the Philippines. So normally when I tell the stories of these great entrepreneurs, I skip their childhoods because it usually isn't relevant to the story. But in Henry C's case, I think it is actually very important for his story and how he became the person that he ended up becoming. So as a 12 year old, Henry was living in China and he was financially supported by his father who had moved to the Philippines, uh, Manila specifically, in order to run a shoe shop where he'd earn the money in the Philippines and then send it back to China. Now Henry wanted to help his father financially support the family. So in 1936, he jumped on a very long and rough sea voyage from China to the Philippines. And from arriving in the port, he then had to follow his dad's directions in order to find his dad's shoe shop. Now upon arriving, he was really set up to fail because he did not speak Tagalog, which is the Filipino language. He had no contacts, no networks apart from his father, nor did he speak any English either. And not only this, but when he actually eventually found his dad's shoe shop in Manila, he actually was a little bit shocked as to how much his dad was really doing it tough. He was working and living as in sleeping every night in his small little shoe store, which is approximately two square meters. So he joined his dad in running this little market shoe store where they'd operate the business during the day and then at night they'd clear all the merchandise off the table and his father would sleep on the floor and Henry would sleep on the bench for which all the merchandise was displayed. And so he was literally sleeping on the street every night. Anyway, as time went by, the store became slightly more and more successful and they had enough money where they could actually start to buy some things and instead of spending it on creature comforts for themselves they decided to spend it on Henry's education where he could properly learn to go like and also English amongst other skills in life. And now it's a common trope that many of the world's greatest entrepreneurs are horrible students but this actually wasn't the case for Henry. He was so determined and so driven to get himself and his family out of poverty that he studied extra hard and worked extra hard and was actually put ahead of his grades for his years in the school. So with his long-standing shoe store and now a great education, the shoe store was starting to grow very slowly in the Manila community and business was starting to improve. Well, this was until 1941 when the Imperial Japanese Army arrived and basically took over the entire city. And they stayed there until 1945 when the Americans kicked them out. Now during the Japanese occupation, Henry himself even got injured during the conflict where he was struck by some collateral damage from an American bomb that was aimed at a Japanese held bridge. But fortunately, he was still able to make ends meet despite having an injured leg as he had purchased cigarettes from American soldiers and then on sell them into the more affluent parts of Manila. Anyway, time went by and before we know it, it was 1945 and the Japanese Imperial Army had been pushed away and many Filipinos could return to their former homes and businesses. And when Henry and his father returned to the market store in Manila, they were devastated just to see the level of destruction that had occurred. In fact, Henry's father became so demoralized that he thought, no, nope, that's it, I'm returning back to China, this isn't worth it. Whereas Henry decided to say, well, yeah, we, we've made a life here, we're starting to make some networks, we'll have to start all over again, but uh, come on, let, let's actually give this a shot. But unfortunately, he couldn't persuade his father to stay with him. And just with this as well, I have to really point out something that's not really widely known. Manila was a city that was devastated in World War II. We all hear about the, the physical destruction that happened in Warsaw or in Berlin, or especially Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and also in Tokyo. But Manila was amongst the most heavily damaged cities in the world. And so it was very demoralizing and very devastating for many Filipinos to return back to their former homes and businesses. And, and while this broke many Filipinos, Henry adapted to the situation. He did what he could to make ends meet. He collected scrap metal and sold it, and he purchased or found th anything that he could use that he could then on sell for a profit. And so Henry, along with many of his fellow Filipinos, were doing it pretty rough for quite a long time. But Henry's first major opportunity came when the bulk of the American forces were then leaving the Philippines to return back to the United States. And when they left, they, the Americans decided to leave a lot of things behind that it just wasn't worth the fuel to bring back to the United States. One of the surplus items that they chose to leave behind was a large shipment of shoes. And so Henry was able to acquire this, and this gave him his first opportunity, as at the time, the American General Infantry boots, they were actually pretty nice looking. They, they weren't like these things that you see today. I need to get more flexible. They're actually, they could double up as dress shoes that you wear to a formal event. So upon Henry getting this vast amount of stock from the American army, Henry now had the inventory, but he didn't have the money and he didn't have a business partner as his father had now left back to China. 
But fortunately, Henry had a school friend that was interested in getting into the shoe business as well, and his name was Leo Kang. And so the two men put their heads together and started up a proper shoe shop as opposed to just a market store. And after a few years, they met an accountant by the name of Senan Mendolia, and he seemed to match Henry's and Leo's ambition for creating a shoe selling empire. So from here, they opened up a couple of shops and they applied for a loan from the Philippines China Bank. So this will come into the story later, so just remember the Philippines China Bank. Anyway, things seemed to be going pretty well for a year. And in 1950, he married his girlfriend, Felicita Ten, and she was a shoelace vendor. Isn't that just a perfect match? A shoe seller and a shoelace seller, and they meet each other and they get married. But in 1954, this role that Henry was on came to a bit of a temporary halt. And this happened when Henry and Leo came to a bit of a disagreement. Whereas Leo just wanted to continue with the shoe shops that they already had and just keep things running the way they are. Whereas Henry wanted to keep expanding. And so they split the mini shoe empire fairly and then both went their separate ways. And I can see both sides of the argument of this. I mean, there's no right or wrong good guy or bad guy in this scenario. They both just wanted different things out of life and... They basically just had to adjust the situation so they could both get what they wanted out of life. So after the split, Henry decided to take a holiday to the United States and also to Europe. But this wasn't purely a holiday because Henry doesn't holiday like that. So the first reason that he went to the United States and Europe was that he wanted to talk to the large shoe companies and maybe potentially talk about shoe distribution deals for when he opens up shops again in the Philippines. And the second reason is that he wanted to look at how people purchase shoes in both Europe and the United States. He wanted to see how shoes are selling so well over there and copy their selling strategies and bring, them, bring those strategies and those tactics back to the Philippines. But he needed a business partner for this. So in 1958, he met a man by the name of Francesco Chong and they started up a new shoe shop called the Tiger Bazaar, which was later rebranded to Shoe Mart. And so with Shoe Mart, was, what was this secret plan or this secret formula that he was going to use where he basically learnt it from the Europeans and the Americans that he's going to apply it to the Philippines? Well, there was four main pillars. And so the first was comfort. He wanted his shoe shops to be a comfortable environment. So shoppers would spend more time in there and the more time they spend in his shops, the more likely they'd be to purchase merchandise. So he made a point of having air conditioning in all of his shops, whereas many shops in, in the Philippines at the time did not have that. The second pillar to his four prong strategy is presentation. And this is more of a European strategy than it was an American strategy, where you have little display shelves and you have all the shoes perfectly and very neatly presented, rather than just all those shoes just thrown into a big basket together. The third pillar was for everything to be neat. And this included for the staff as well. So when recruiting, he had the same idea for his shoe staff to be looked at in the same light as flight attendant. Everything is just to be neat, perfect, and very well groomed as this would make shoppers more likely to spend more time in his shoe shops as well. The fourth pillar, and to me personally, this is the biggest secret to his success, was that he had fixed pricing. Many consumers hate negotiating, and negotiation is such a waste of the staff's time. So not only are you saving the customer's time, but you're also saving your own time and your own employee's time, hence making your business more efficient. And it turns out that this secret business plan ended up being very successful and business is booming for all of the shoe shops across Manila. And at this point, Henry wanted to expand to other parts of the Philippines where his, his partner Chong only wanted to keep a presence in Manila only. And so just as Henry had done with his previous business partner, when they realized that they had different ambitions for the company, they decided to split the company fairly. And so Chong ended up becoming Shoe World and Henry ended up becoming Shoe Mart. So in 1963, Henry opened up his first shoe shop that is outside of Manila, but this is in Makati, and he recruited his six children to work for him. Now, this family together opened up three more branches, including one in Manila, and it was at this point that Henry had the ambition to say, well, why, why should I only sell shoes? Why can't I sort of become like the Macy's of America or the Kmart or Target of Australia? And so upon realizing this and upon realizing how much extra money there is in selling a wider range of merchandise, he then rebranded Shoe Mart to become SM. Him. And do you remember earlier in the story when I was talking about the Filipino China bank who gave him his first loan? Well, to repay that favor, guess what Henry did? He purchased the entire bank. As in, he didn't only pay back the loan, he bought the bank that gave him the loan. I mean, how cool is that? And not only this, he also purchased another bank, the BDO bank, which is the biggest bank in the Philippines. And so, Henry now owned two very large Filipino banks. And so now with his successful SM shops and now with owning two banks, he was able to expand even further and faster. 
And now he reached a point and said, instead of just running individual shops, why don't I build and run entire shopping malls? So he built his first one in Makati, and this ended up being such a success, so he could end up building more and more shopping malls all over the Philippines, including in his original city, Manila. And although things were going really well for Henry right now, things were not going so well for the rest of the Philippines, as they were coming into a very turbulent period in their history. So it's 1986 and many investors, both international and domestic, are pulling their money out of the Philippines because of the People Power Revolution, which saw the removal of Fernand Marcos from power. And there was stagflation and the Philippines had a very uncertain future. And to explain why international investors were afraid, interest rates were 45%. Well, while most international investors and Filipinos saw danger and risk, Henry saw opportunity. So whilst everyone else in the Philippines and also international investors were either trying to save money or shrink away from risky ventures, Henry opened up the biggest shopping mall in all of Asia, in North Edsa. And had food courts and cinemas and basically all the things that we take for granted today in the big shopping malls. And just as Henry had predicted, eventually this Filipino crisis turned around, the country started to get back on its feet and Henry basically owned all the big shopping malls. So now let's fast forward to 1994 and they listed on the public stock exchange where individual investors could buy shares and Henry sees empire. And with this new money from the share market investors, they were then able to expand to other parts of the Philippines and also even into China. And as of now, if we look at the seven biggest shopping malls in all of Asia, the C empire owns four of them. And in total, the C business owns 72 malls in the Philippines and seven in China today. Now, unfortunately, Henry died in January 19, 2019. And at his peak, his net worth was $19 billion. So, I mean, how is that for rags to riches? He is in a foreign country. He doesn't speak the language of this country that he's moved to. He is literally sleeping on the street every night. And towards the end of his life, he is the richest person in that country and also amongst the richest people in the world. And so I challenge any of you in the comments to try and find a better rags to riches story than that. And if I, if I personally had to summarize his success into two words, I'd say it'll be like and subscribe. Just kidding. But it'd actually be consistent grit.